So we're going to be, as I mentioned, in John 14 this morning. So, the title of today's message is Believe God. Believe God. Father, as we open up your word today, I just ask that you would help us to, to hear. Give us, give us ears to hear, Father, and, and I, eyes to see. A heart that's willing to receive and a mind that's willing to apply. Father, we are so grateful for the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that, that his death did not end in the tomb, but it was just the beginning in the tomb of a new life, not only for him but for us, and we're thankful for that, Father God. Lord, we don't deserve any of the good things that you have given us, yet you continue to give us good things, and we are grateful for that as well. Help me, Lord, just to preach what you want preached this morning, that your name would be glorified, that your name would be lifted up. And Lord, before I preach, I, we also lift up unsaved family members who do not know you, who this morning find no significance in this day of the resurrection and this day of Easter. We lift them up to you and we ask that next Easter at this time that they would know the importance of this day, that you would save them and that they would be following you and serving you. By this time next year, we ask, Lord, that this would be your merciful will. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So the title of today's sermon is uh, Believe God. And this is the 11th, I was thinking about it last night, the 11th time that I have preached on a Easter morning in this church. So for 11 other times I have preached, or 10 other times I have preached, and except for maybe three of those messages, I do not remember what I preached before. I can remember a couple of messages what I do know is that the text that we're going to look at this morning, I have not preached on before as far as I can tell, and especially not on an Easter or a Resurrection Sunday. But I wanted to preach it today. Why? Because I find it very comforting. I don't know if anybody has noticed this world has gotten awful crazy, and there are a lot of crazy people in this world. And it's not very comforting to be around a lot of the crazy people in this world. And what I mean by crazy are people that are just living their lives of sin. They, they don't care anything about morality. They don't care anything about people around them. They don't care, you know, about anything other than selves. I mean, in the... Jesus says in the last days that the love of many will grow cold. And that's the day we're living in. And, and I don't find what I see in society very comforting. So I needed some scriptures to bring comfort this morning. So let us open up and let us read what Jesus has to say in John 14, starting at verse 1. Jesus is telling his disciples and us, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am you may also be. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. I find those words comforting. To know he's coming back. You know, the night before his crucifixion, 
Jesus says that to his disciples and many more things. If you really want to know some of the things he talked to his disciples about, the best place to go is John's gospel because there's a long dissertation of the things that he was telling his disciples. He was cramming into their heads before he was cramming into their heads before he would die the next day. Now he's looking at in the text in John, right before he told the disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled, right before that Jesus tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Well, that's probably a troubling thing to them. And right before Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times, then, or right around that time, Jesus then says, oh, and he says to his disciples, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Uh, to me, that's pretty troubling. That Jesus would tell me to love you as he loves you. I, I find that troubling, because I can't do that, folks. And, and the disciples maybe were a little troubled by that. Why? Because Jesus had just been down on his knees. He had just washed their feet earlier on prior. I mean, that's kind of troubling. Most people can't love the person next to them in church on a Sunday morning. They, they have a lot of trouble. Or not most people, but many people. They have a lot of trouble with that. But, you know, Jesus is saying, uh, they're going to know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So maybe they were troubled by that. Maybe they're troubled by hearing that Peter was going to deny them. Maybe they're troubled by hearing that they had to love one another just as good as Jesus was loving them. But even before that, Jesus has spent two or three days continually telling his disciples that he was going to Jerusalem to be crucified and that he would die and he would lay in the grave for three days and he would be raised. And, and it says in Scripture, when we looked at it going through Mark's gospel and such, it, it says that they didn't understand they didn't understand. They knew he was going to die, but what was this whole raising of the dead sort of thing going to be in his case? And, and around this whole time, right before he says to love one another, and, right bef you know, and before he says that Peter's going to deny him, Jesus also sits there and says, you know what? The betrayer is at this table. The one who's going to betray me is at this table. That had to be pretty troubling. I mean, we know that in the Gospels, they all ask themselves, is it I, Lord? Is it I? Am I the one that is betraying you? So they were really troubled at that point. I mean, Jesus is going to die. He's going to die very soon. And to the disciples, whether they fully understand what's going on or not, that realization is very troubling indeed, that Jesus is going to die. Because you think about it, this is the same man who they had seen feed thousands upon thousands of people. It is the same man that they had seen heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead... The same one that they saw transfigured, three of them saw transfigured in glory. It's the same Jesus that's been telling them he's going to die. They have seen him transfigured in glory. They have seen and heard him speak with authority of God. And they have seen him stun the wisest of the men on the earth with a wisdom that is from heaven that was far more surpassing than any of their wisdoms ever could be. And it is that Jesus that is sitting before them, that they confessed is the Son of God, that they know to be the Christ and the Messiah. It is that Jesus who is going to die, and die very soon. And I'll tell you what, that is a very troubling thought for them sitting there that he was going to die and lay in the grave. Jesus, their leader, was going to be taken from them, and he would die. Jesus, their deliverer, was going to be delivered up, and he would die. Jesus, their friend, in a moment's time, was going to be betrayed, denied, and every one of them was going to flee from the scene. 
And that's troubling. That's really troubling, folks. The disciples were troubled, troubled in the same manner that we ourselves are troubled at times. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I have. That one moment we feel that the presence of God is so near, only to find ourselves just minutes later feeling as if the whole world is crashing down upon us and that God has somehow fled. Maybe it's just me that has had those ups and downs. Maybe not. I hope that you understand how that feels. I hope you know how it feels to have the bull by the horns to be on the top of the world one moment and then the next moment to hear a doctor say something like, sorry, it's cancer. It's an emotional ride, folks, to be in that place. I mean, your life just seems to be going along so perfectly and then all of a sudden you hear those words, it's cancer. I mean, you may know how it feels to leave home, to drive to work in your new car. All oh, life is so good. You get to work and all you find is a pink slip waiting with your name on it. I mean, you may know how it feels to get the call that so-and-so has died. And all you can think about is, man, just yesterday we had the greatest time together. It was so unexpected. How did that happen? That's probably how these disciples were feeling. They're on the top of the world, and within a very short time, their world was going to be crushing down around them. We all know how these times fill. When one more moment we are riding high and the next moment we are laying in the mud run over. I mean, I can hear the disciples right now as I'm, as I'm going through this. Hey, Jesus, uh, you know, you're dying on the cross. Not part of our plan. Let's just, not, let's just not have any talk like that. It's not part of our plan. We like things the way they are. How about let's just keep them all together? You and us, you and us, us and you. We have no more time for this death talk, Jesus. The problem is, God's plan was different than the plan of the disciples. As is the case with us, God's plan is often quite different from our own plans. And you know what? That's troubling to us. It is really troubling when God's plans don't line up with our plans. It brings us really discontentment at times. I mean, this morning, maybe you, maybe you are troubled. I mean, did you have a good night's sleep last night? Or did you lay awake again thinking about all those things that trouble you? about all those things that you fear and dread. Is your heart troubled this morning? Here's a shocker for you. That same word translated there, troubled, by John, used by John for troubled, means distressed. I mean, so it's a pretty deep consternation. That same word is used two other places in John's Gospel, both referring to Jesus. Jesus himself was troubled in the same way at times as his disciples were feeling. For Jesus, in addition to being fully God, we have to remember he was fully man. Jesus was fully man, and he was fully God. So Jesus, the Son of Man had emotions. And one of those emotions we find in Scripture is the emotion of being troubled, being distressed. In John eleven thirty two, the word troubled that is used here in John 14 is used referring to Jesus. And what this, this subject is, is Jesus goes to where Lazarus has died Lazarus is in the tomb and everybody is weeping around Jesus and we are told that Jesus felt troubled. He felt distressed. He felt the same feeling that he's telling his disciples not to feel. Do not be troubled. And in John eleven thirty two, 32, we are told that Jesus became troubled and distressed. In fact, about Lazarus. But then in John 1227 Jesus says this he says my soul is troubled and what shall I say 
Father, save me from this hour? No, for this purpose I have come to this hour. So those are two of the places where the word trouble is used in addition to Jesus telling his, distra- his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. You know what? Being troubled by things is normal. Because many things, I don't know if you've noticed it, many things in this world are very troubling. You know, they're very distressing. Many things, are, many things out there can cause us to worry. Yet Jesus has this word for his disciples, and that is the same word he wants you and I to hear today, and that word is, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So there's got to be a difference there between, you know, Jesus feeling troubled and then him telling his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. There's a difference there. What is that difference? I'll tell you what that difference is. When Jesus felt troubled, when he felt distressed, Jesus' heart did not remain troubled. He did not remain distressed. But we often do. At times, we are tormented by thoughts and situations that trouble us, by those things that bring us stress. I mean, at times, I don't know about the rest of you, but at times, years after an event, years after something has taken place, some circumstance, years after that, still, every time we think of that event, we feel the same feelings of consternation, trouble, and despair, and distress. Jesus isn't like that. Years after, he doesn't. That's the big difference. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Here's what Jesus is basically telling his disciples. Do not let your world be shaken when things don't go as you had hoped or expected or planned. Instead, and this is how we can prevent our hearts from remaining troubled, instead, believe in God and believe in me. When something troubles us, We do not have to allow our hearts to continue in that trouble. Those things that distress us do not have to consume us. Well, how do we prevent that? Well, by believing in God and believing in Jesus. Believing in God and believing in Jesus means we trust God more than we trust our eyes, more than we trust our ears, more than we trust our feelings. It means that our hope is placed in God even when circumstances tempt us to lose our hope or to place our trust elsewhere. Circumstance may chide us saying walk away from God because look at what havoc following him has brought to your life. Or circumstance may tempt us doing it your way will bring you much more pleasure than doing it his way ever will. And circumstance may lie to us, may say you're losing far too much because of this Jesus. It is not worth it. It will not be worth it in the end. Circumstance is often a very big liar as to what reality is. Circumstance will do everything in its power to focus our attention upon those people, words, or deeds that will most quickly take our eyes, ears, and minds off of Jesus Christ and the works of God. Circumstance will do everything it can do to rob us of any hope by convincing us that worldly hope is more credible than heavenly hope can ever be. Circumstance will try to get us to believe that the world has all the answers, that God has none of them. We've got this problem. It's called the resurrection. This resurrection is one that gives hope of another time and another place and another world. It's, the resurrection stands in, in sharp contrast to circumstance. 
believe in God and also believe in me. Well, what does that mean? Well, for starters, we believe God, the Son, came in the flesh of Jesus Christ so he could tell us how things really are. You know, all of us sit in this room. We think we, we understand the world. We think we got it all figured out. We, we can see things. We can hear things. But the reality of things is we don't even have a clue about the world. I mean, I just heard a couple of weeks ago they just discovered like another 10 species they never even knew were on the planet, right? We don't even have a clue what's underneath our feet. Dig down here, you know, 200 feet. We don't have a clue what's there. 300 feet, 400 feet, we don't have a clue. For starters, we believe God, the Son, came in the flesh of Jesus Christ so he could tell us how things really are. Now, what are some of the things that Jesus tells us? Well, right away, Jesus reminds us that God created us. So there's a truth we ought to remember. God created us. Jesus also points numerous times to the law of God, that God gave us a law. So God created us, God gave us a law, and the next thing that Jesus reminds us of in Scripture is that God demands perfection from us. He demands that we perfectly keep his law. And along with that, Jesus reminds us, and his very first word spoken in Scripture, in his ministry, when he turns 30, the first words are, repent and believe. He reminds us that because we cannot keep God's law, we need to repent and we need to believe upon him. So the, the thing is, for starters, if we say we believe Jesus is God in the flesh, then we ought to believe what he tells us. Not a, just some of it, all of it. But then next we must believe upon God and upon God the Son, Jesus Christ. Why must we do that? Because Jesus tells us the importance of new life in Scripture. Unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus tells us that. One of the most famous passages of Scripture, the verses everybody likes to quote, is John 3.16. Well, let us hear what that dialogue is. For, jo for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So, for, so what we need to do is believe upon God, believe upon his words that he came that God the Father sent God the Son to die for us because we were already condemned and to take away our condemnation. We believe him when Jesus tells us that we must be born again because we, because we already stand condemned. And then that belief makes us turn away from our sins and gratitude towards him that he might save us. And, and next we believe that once we have been born again, and here's where Easter comes in. That once we have been born again, we have a loving Father in heaven who knows and does what is best for us, even when circumstance tells us otherwise. We need to believe that. We, so we need to believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. We need to believe what Jesus says about repentance and belief that we might have salvation. And next, after we're saved, we need to believe that we have this loving Father. That's going to help us get through our days to understand that we have a loving Father. Jesus tells us that we have a Father in heaven who knows our needs even before we ask, Matthew 6, 8. And he also tells us that we have a Father in heaven who knows how to give good gifts to us. That's Luke eleven thirteen. And Jesus tells us that we have a Father in heaven who sees his children as valuable. I mean, he's actually counted the hairs on our head 
He sees us as valuable, his children. Luke 12, 7. So that's some of the good news that if you have been born again, if you have placed your hope in Jesus for salvation instead of hoping in your own good works to save you, if you have repented and turned from your sins, then you have a Father in heaven who loves you, who knows your needs, who cares about you. And we have God the Son who came to tell us that because he wanted us to know. Let not your hearts be troubled, my brothers and sisters. Believe in God. Believe also in Christ. And then Jesus promises, this is just so cool, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. To me, that is just one of the most wonderful thoughts. That's what the resurrection tells me. Jesus isn't dead. He's not there anymore. He has gone on. He's preparing a place for me. Isn't that such a wonderful thought that Jesus Christ, in the midst of his followers' troubled hearts, tells them, do not be troubled. I could have prepared a place for you. My Father has a mansion, and there is a room waiting for you. That's comforting to know that that day is coming. I mean, I hear kind and loving words coming from the mouth of Christ. Words that are meant to assure me that in the end all things are going to work out. Words that are meant to comfort me. That no matter what my worries, my fears, or my circumstances tell me, there is a better day coming because he's coming back for me. I like um, one of the things Keith Green said. He said that, you know, God prepared this earth, this earth around us in six days, and for 2,000 years he's been pre- preparing the place for us to go next. I mean, if this is that great, how much greater? It's just, it's a wonderful thought. You know, and I do not have, I mean, some people at this point would probably want to start preaching on you know, how, how big our rooms are, what kind of uh, wallpaper they have and all of that. You know what? I don't have a clue what the Father's mansion looks like or what my room or my dwelling place is going to be. But here is what I do know. It's going to be good. It is going to be good because I have a good Father and a loving Father. And He knows what is right. What I do know is both the mansion and the rooms are going to be very good. Well, how do I know that? Well, Paul says this, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and upon the heart of man has not come up that which God has prepared for those who love him. I mean, I can think of some pretty spectacular like heavens. And Paul says, you know what? The glories of heaven haven't even occurred to us how glorious they are. And I can think of some really good places, you know. I mean, Ben and Jerry living on this side of me. (laughs) Mr. Breyer living over here. It ain't going to be nothing, folks. Your best picture of heaven, it's going to be better. It's going to be better. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. How could Jesus speak those words the night before his crucifixion? I can tell you how he could speak them. It's because he knew the outcome of the crucifixion. He knew the outcome of the circumstances that he was in would be good. Good for him and good for many others. God the Son knew his death would not end in the grave, but it would end with the resurrection, which was the beginning of a new life. He knew that the grave for us then would not be the end, but it would be the beginning as well. He knew it. He could make those promises. He knew it. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John 12, 24. 
We in this room are the fruit. We have been, we are the fruit born of Jesus' body going to the grave. And Paul says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? <laughs> you foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that it will be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. The first man was born from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. 1 Corinthians 15. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful that, that no matter how things are today, they're going to get better. The perishable is going to be replaced with the imperishable. The dishonored with glory. Yes, today, this morning, we have aches and pains and we have fears and we have worried and worries and we have those things that distress and those things that trouble us. Yes. And yes, things today will not always go as we plan. That's true. And yes, some days are going to be good days while others are going to be just downright miserable ones. It's true. I mean, that's what life is here on this earth. Unfortunately, that is what the sin of Adam and Eve brought us. The sin of man brings us miserable days. And God in his mercy at times gives us good ones. But the good news is that just as the life of Jesus did not end in the grave, neither will our lives who have put our faith in Christ Jesus and our hope in him for salvation, neither will our lives end in the grave. The grave will be the beginning. We will be planted the imperishable and raised. We will be planted the perishable and raised the imperishable. I mean, that's a glorious day. One day, and I pray that it be sooner rather than later, Jesus is going to return, and in a moment, in the twinkling of eye, we're going to be changed to glory. And he's going to take us to that place he has prepared for us. That's what, you know, Resurrection Sunday, Easter, it's about that. Jesus can hold to that promise because he is the first fruits. He has been raised from the dead and we can hope in him because we ourselves will be raised in the day. I mean, how can I say that? It's because I believe Jesus and I believe in the one who sent him. I believe God and I have a good reason too. What's that good reason, you ask? How can I believe any of this? How can I believe any of this Bible? I'll tell you how. Because if I went right now and I looked for the tomb of Abraham. And I found the tomb of Abraham, the one who is the father of the Jewish faith. If I found that tomb, and if I looked inside, you know what I would find? I'd find Abraham. His bones, they would still be there. And if we, if we took a field trip and we went to the tomb of Muhammad, you know what we're going to find? We're going to find Muhammad's dead bones in that tomb. And if we went to the resting place of Buddha, then again, dead Buddha bones, we're going to find them. And if we went to, you know, humanists, Socrates, we'd find where Socrates is buried. 
And if we could ever figure out who the, practi- the first practitioner of Taoism was, I guarantee you, he's still dead. And if we could go and figure out who the first person to think of this concept of reincarnation in Hinduism is, I promise you, he's still dead. Dead, dead, and more dead. But if you and I take a field trip as I in Maryland did once, and if we go to the tomb of Jesus Christ, you know what you're going to find? It's empty. Why? Because Jesus is not dead. He is alive. He is not there. The tomb is empty. It was only occupied for three days. He is not in the tomb like Muhammad is. He's not in the tomb like Buddha is. He's not in the tomb like Abraham is. He's not in the tomb like any of these other people that started their own little religions are. Why? Because he's alive. Because the tomb is emptied. He is not there because he has gone ahead to prepare a place for us. And where he is, he will come back one day from and take us there to him. That's why I can believe all this is because of the empty tomb. It's because of the empty tomb. He's going to come back and he's going to take us with him. You know, to wrap this up on Wednesday night, we looked at the last part of a video on the authenticity of the Bible and how you can trust it. And one of the things that is very telling is the, the tremendous number of manuscripts here. Why? Why are there thousands upon thousands of manuscripts really close to it? Why? I'll tell you why. Because manuscripts are still being made today. Because this message is so important that people think that somebody needs to know that Jesus is alive. And even in, in places in this world, in China today, they're still hand copying the Bible. They're still producing manuscripts. As soon as Jesus came out of that tomb, they had to tell somebody. They had to go tell somebody. And they started writing letters to everyone here, here's a letter that talks about this. It's, it's called the, the Gospel of John. Here, let me send you a copy of it. It's important news. Let me send you the copy of the Gospel of Mark and the copy of the Gospel of Luke and the po- copy of the Gospel of Matthew. Come on, let's get these things out because it's important. Why? Because Jesus is alive. What does that mean? That we don't have to worry about death. Today is Resurrection Sunday. It's a day of joyous and jubilant celebration. It's a day of great promise and a day of great hope. Why? Because Jesus has gone ahead and he's coming back for us. So let not, as you leave here today, as we leave here this morning, let not us leave with hearts that are troubled and that remain troubled. Why? Because we can believe upon him and we can believe the truth that he's coming again for us. Yes, we will have troubling things in this world. They will get on our nerves at times. They will stress us out. But we don't have to live under the weight or the pressure of them because he has risen from the dead and he's coming back to take us with him. Yeah, soon and very soon. Going to see my king. Soon and very soon. So let not your hearts remain troubled, but believe in God and believe in His Son, Jesus. Why? Because He's coming back for us. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that You are coming back to take us home. Lord, that very hope there gets us through this day. That very hope will get us through this day, Father God, that you are coming again, that you are taking us to glory, that your resurrection was just the first fruits of our resurrection, that one day, even though we go to the grave, we will will walk out of that grave into glory. And that is because of all that you have done, and we thank you for that. Lord, as we end our service today, as we go forth in a song, Lord, let us go forth to the joy of the Lord. And let us do this to the glory of Christ. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.